On January 22nd, 1883, the New York Times lamented, It is a mockery of science and human skill that a ship so well appointed, so furnished with all the modern appliances, that the Cimbria should be run down and sunk, with nearly all on board. Before there was RMS Titanic, there was SS Cimbria, and the victims of the Cimbria disaster deserve to be remembered. SS Cimbria was built by the Scottish shipbuilding and engineering firm Caird & Company, based in Greencock. The 3,037-ton packet steamer was iron-hulled. 339.9 feet long with a beam of 40 feet, she had three decks, six bulkheads, and seven watertight compartments. The ship's five boilers drove a single screw, and she also included two sailing masts, common in this period and useful to a ship operating in the windswept North Sea. The ship made its maiden voyage from Hamburg to New York via Southampton on April 13, 1867. The Hampshire Advertiser wrote of the ship on April 20th, She is constructed to carry eight first-class cabin passengers, 122nd cabin and 500 steerage, besides 137 of a crew, nearly 900 souls altogether. The accommodation for all classes of passengers is everything that can be desired. The main saloon, which is 100 feet in length, is a very handsome apartment, beautifully decorated. The accommodation for first-class passengers is of a luxurious description, and due regard has been paid to the comfort of other classes. The second class being better provided for on this noble vessel than first-class passengers used to be in former days, not very long ago. In fact, a voyage across the Atlantic on a steamer such as this is robbed of half its terrors. Serving with the Hamburg-America line, Cimbria was fast. The Chicago Advertiser wrote in June 1867, the shortage passage yet across the Atlantic has been made by the new German steamship, Cimbria. Reporting that Cimbria made an average speed of 326 miles a day, the advertiser rated her faster than SS Persia, the canard liner then generally considered to be the fastest in the world. Cimbria continued the Hamburg to New York route for a decade, but in 1878 became the focus of a mystery and possible scandal. At the time, a diplomatic row was leading to the threat of war between Russia and England. The Cimbria was chartered by Tsar Alexander II. She went to the Baltic, where she picked up men of the Imperial Russian Navy on, on April 30th at 7 o'clock in the morning, arrived at Southwest Harbor in Maine. Exactly why the ship was there was unclear. According to a May 1878 edition of the Boston Globe, the ship's captain, named Bedenhausen, professed utter ignorance of the destination of the vessel or men. He said the boat was chartered by an agent of the Russian government and was under orders of one of the cabin passengers, whom the glove reports has the bearing of a naval officer and is a Russian. The speculation was that the Cimbria was being outfitted as an auxiliary cruiser to act as a privateer or blockade runner should the nations go to war. It was an unlikely possibility for the passenger steamer, but don't all good stories involve pirates? Fortunately, a compromise was mediated by Otto von Bismarck, and war averted. Stephen A. Schaff, writing in the autumn 1993 edition of Sea History, notes, The threat to war thus abated. The Cimbria, together with its passengers of guttural speech and military main, quietly slipped her cables in the dark of night and departed the southwest harbor as furtively as she had appeared some weeks earlier. Once again, she became a popular German transatlantic liner on the Hamburg-Southampton New York run. The mystery faded from the news, but... S.S. Cimbria would find its way back into the headlines. On January 17, 1883, Cimbria left Hamburg, bound for Le Havre, France, and then on to New York. The ship was under the command of Captain Julius Hansen, whom the line reported had commanded the ship for nearly a year and was about 40 years of age and had been previously employed by the line. He was described by people who knew him as a very careful and efficient officer. Officers who had served with him previously said that he was considered unnecessarily careful in running his vessels in fog or thick weather. Numbers reported at the time differed, but utilizing the original passenger list, the Shipwreck Museum in Cuxhaven, Germany, concludes that 493 persons were on board, including 91 crewmen, one French pilot from Le Havre, and 401 passengers that a Berlin newspaper described as mostly poor Prussian, Hungarian, and Russian peasants including 72 women and 87 children. Most of these would have been immigrants coming to the United States. 
14 passengers were French sailors who had only booked passage to Le Havre. The ship was also carrying a group of Chippewa Indians that had been touring Europe displaying Wild West paraphernalia. The New York Times reported that the Chippewa were supposed to have left on an earlier steamer, but their departure had been delayed because of the illness of one of their party. 141 years ago today, on January 19th, Cimbria was in the North Sea, northwest of the German island of Borkum. A passenger would later report that the weather was clear up to 1.15 o'clock, but a fog set in which continued and increased in density. The engines of the Cimbria were kept at full speed until 1.30 o'clock, and then at half speed until 2 o'clock, after which they were kept at slow speed. The slower speed was intended to reduce the chance of collision, but as the ship's second officer would later testify, the ship steered badly when going slow. The passenger reported at about 2.10 o'clock the whistle of another steamer was heard, and the engines of the Cimbria were stopped instantly. The whistle came from the British passenger cargo steamship SS Sultan of the Hull and Hamburg line. Built by C&W Earl Shipbuilding of Hull, Sultan had been completed in 1867. 239 feet in length, at 1,025 gross registered tons, the Sultan was much smaller than Cimbria, carrying no passengers and a load of coal. The captain of the Sultan, named Cuthill, reported that the Sultan had made an unusually rapid passage and sighted the Borkum Light between 1 and 2 o'clock Saturday morning. The weather was hazy and soon after became very foggy. The engines were eased to a dead slow and the steam whistle was kept sounding every few seconds. The captain and first officer were on the bridge and two of the hands were looking forward. Suddenly the green and masthead lights of a steamer were seen two points on the starboard bow. The witness aboard the Cimbria stated that the Sultan's green light was owing to the fog, not observed until she was only 150 feet off the Cimbria. There was some confusion over exactly what happened next. Captain Cuthill reported that he thought the approaching steamer would keep her course to go clear. It was noticed, however, that she suddenly ported and came around rapidly. It was too late to do anything but reverse, which was done, but by the time the engines had revolved once, the captain noticed that the other steamer's port light coming round rapidly towards the Sultan. It became clear that the vessels would collide. A court of inquiry later determined that the collision occurred while the Cimbrian was turning to the right and the Sultan to the left. A survivor aboard Cimbria reported that the ship was struck abaft the first collision bulkhead on the port side, and she heeled over starboard and speedily sank. Cattell reported that there was great consternation aboard the Sultan, as it was feared that so much larger a vessel would sink her. Investigation later determined that the Cimbria was struck 40 feet from her bow after making a breach. The Sultan scraped along the Cimbria and completely rolled up her iron plates. It is evident, the report reads, the blow must have been a tremendous one. A dispatch from Hamburg reported that several persons were killed by the collision itself, owing to the flying about of splinters and planks. A report in the Salt Lake Herald said that the Cimbria sustained such severe injuries in the collision that it at once became apparent she must sink almost immediately. The officers, therefore, did all in their power to save lives. The New York Times recorded the story of survivor Fran Pliska, a young bohemian who said he was a steerage passenger on the Cimbria. Pliska reported that he was awakened by a loud crash and the screams of women and children. He jumped out of his bunk and saw the water rushing between the desks. He ran up to the main deck, and there he found a large crowd of passengers, panic-stricken, screaming with all their might towards the English steamer. The Herald continued that without a moment's loss of time, life belts were distributed among the passengers, and an order was given to lower the boats. This, however, on the consequence of the vessel keeling over on her side, was found to be very difficult on one side, and absolutely impossible on the other. J. F. H. Meyer, an agent for the line, told the New York Times that the Cimbria was well-equipped with life-saving appliances, having eight large lifeboats, which would each hold 65 persons, but Mr. Meyer was of the opinion that at least two of the boats had been destroyed in the collision. The London Sunday Dispatch gave the report of a cabin passenger named Vegert, who, when he arrived on deck, found all the passengers and seamen frantically endeavoring to lower the boats. This was not possible as the ship had heeled over onto one side. One boat was capsized immediately, and the second boat was also capsized, and all the occupants, chiefly women, were drowned. Vegard asked the officer what to do, and the officer replied that all was lost. Save yourself, he added, if possible, in the shrouds. By most reports, only three boats were lowered before the ship sank. The Times wrote, Pliska got in one of the lifeboats, and in that boat there were two men and a woman holding a child under each arm. 
The hull of the steamer was, meanwhile, going down lower and lower, and in another minute the deck disappeared beneath the surface of the water. Just then, the steamer righted itself again, and the movement swung the boat, which contained Pliska, between the masts. A terrific cry from the drowning passengers rent the air, and then everything became still. As the boat was swung near a mast, it was capsized, and Pliska alone of its occupants was saved. He was thrown against the masts and climbed up into the yards. Johann Gonski got into a boat, but it was overloaded. The Times wrote that as soon as it was pushed off, it upset. One of the Indians was in the boat, and he was drowned. Like Pliska, Gonski swam back to the boat and climbed into the rigging. In the end, only one lifeboat would make it away. The Salt Lake City Deseret News printed a report from Hamburg that said that those that secured places had a violent struggle to keep the boat from being swamped. The six Indians were driven away by some sailors by axe blows at their hands. Survivor Robert Schutt had, along with his mother and sister, gotten onto a boat, but as the boat was lowered, it, he fell into the water. He held onto a rope, but it was torn from his hand. He caught hold of the side of another boat, but the sailors pushed him off, and he sank again. On rising to the surface, he again caught the side of the boat and held on, and the sailors, seeing that they could not push him off, allowed him to get in. He never saw his mother or sister again. A dispatch from Berlin reported that of the women aboard the Cimbria, only three were saved. One was a young Polish girl who was on her way to join her parents in America with her aunt, who drowned before her eyes. Another girl saved herself by holding fast to the edge of the boat. She could only be dragged in after an hour and a half's immersion. The dispatch reported that up to the last moment the survivors endeavored to rescue all they could, but as silence came on they found no more alive, but only met occasionally with the bodies of the drowned. The crew had distributed life belts, and the crew had even cut the ship's spars to create more wreckage that passengers could cling to. The dispatch from Berlin noted that as Second Officer Smith was still engaged in cutting the spars loose so that there should be as much driftwood as possible for the people to cling to when the inevitable foundering occurred, the vessel went down under his feet. But the Deseret News reported, those thus provided were not benefited, for most of them died from the severe cold. Survivors that escaped in boats say that when they rowed away, the water was covered with the bodies, kept up by life belts. Second Officer Smith, however, managed to swim to a lifeboat and survived. The boat had 39 passengers on it. They were rescued by the steamer SS Theta after it had, a London report noted, been tossing about nine hours and was waterlogged. The Hamburg American Company sent out the steamer Hansa and the four largest steamers of Coxhaven to search for the other boats of the Cimbria, but no other boats were found. There were survivors in the rigging. The Cimbria went down in 90 feet of water and the mastheads remained above the water. But salvation there was also not easy. Pliska noted that initially a number of passengers had climbed into the rigging at the suggestion of a ship's officer, but just then the Cimbria began bending over to one side and the passengers made a rush to the other. When the steamer bent over, Pliska said, the people who had climbed into the rigging were shaken off into the water like so many flies. Those that made it back to the rigging were mostly survivors from the boats that capsized. Beggert told the Sunday Dispatch that First Officer Carlo urged as many passengers as possible to go up in the rigging, but most of them were quite bewildered and others nearly frantic. High up, with me in the rigging, there were some 25 persons, Beggert said. Then, in the deep darkness and with the fog all around us, the cold became unsupportable. Several of those in the rigging became delirious and let go their hold. The survivors were eventually rescued by a boat from the steamer Diamond. A London report said that they remained in this position for ten miserable hours, freezing from cold and expecting every minute to be the last, till rescued by the boat from the diamond. Only seventeen were rescued from the rigging. With the lifeboat, only fifty-nine of the 493 aboard survived. The London report goes on. The survivors described the scenes as horrible and heartrending. A dispatch from Hamburg wrote of a passenger in the shrouds begging his neighbors to push him into the sea him being too much chilled to move himself. They refused to do so when he let himself fall headlong into the waters. An elderly woman holding her Bible in her cramped hands and singing loudly funeral hymns was washed away from the deck. Two girls belonging to the Salvation Singing Troop, having secured life belts, swam around frantically crying, Help! Help! Save us! The people in the rigging replied, Come to the rigging! We cannot move! And the girls, half benumbed and unable to swim, cried out for the last time, We cannot come! and disappeared beneath the waves. The New York Times wrote that a Hamburg correspondent narrating incidents which occurred on board the Simbra after the collision says the tumult on board was indescribable. One married couple cut their own throats in order that they may 
die together. The ship's surgeon encouraged those in the rigging to hold fast, but several became delirious and let go their hold. Surgeon Mueller subsequently leaped into the sea, saying that he would make an end to it. The dispatch from Berlin noted some of those lost. Christian Bohm and Joseph Gutz, Americans, are missing. A rising young German writer, Leo Haberman of Vienna, who was well known for his excellent descriptions of Russian life, and the Sisters Romner, professional singers well known as the Swabian Nightingales, who had recently been performing in Berlin, perished. Berlin suffered greatly by the disaster, with six families having lost their breadwinners. A subscription was opened for the benefit of the sufferers. Deaths among the crew included Captain Hansen, who reportedly stayed at his post until the end. He left behind a wife and two young children in Hamburg. Weggert said that Chief Officer Karloa disappeared beneath the waves doing his duty, and that Chief Engineer F. Alpen showed Bengal lights until the sea washed him away. Many of the survivors expressed outrage at the captain of the Sultan and his crew they thought should have stopped and rendered aid, but Cuthill testified that his own ship was so damaged that it was in danger of sinking itself, that the damage meant that it couldn't move forward, and that he didn't know that the Cimbria was as damaged as it was. He didn't know that it had foundered until he returned to port. A court of inquiry absolved Cuthill and his crew of any wrongdoing. Cimbria sunk in less than 15 minutes. The New York Times lamented, for all our boasted advances in science, in mechanics, in engineering, we are as far from ever from making ocean voyages safe. And that sentiment would still be true 29 years later, in 1912. And yet, while we remember the sinking of the Titanic, the sinking of the Cimbria is today nearly forgotten. The sinking of the Cimbria, the Titanic of its time, made newspapers worldwide when it happened, but today is so forgotten that as of the production of this episode, it doesn't even merit its own page on Wikipedia. And yet, the victims of the sinking of the Cimbria deserve to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 